In California, detectives investigated a gruesome murder. The suspect fled and was eventually caught in Arizona. His confinement didn't last long. He escaped and disappeared into the Grand Canyon, robbing and kidnapping tourists as he went. To stop the elusive killer, FBI agents and local officers joined forces on a dangerous manhunt. Killer was on the loose in one of America's most popular tourist destinations. Armed and desperate, he evaded law enforcement at every turn. As the 4th of July weekend quickly approached, thousands of people became potential targets. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents would use any means necessary to track a killer before he could strike again. In the early morning hours of September 20th, 1990, a fisherman cast a line into the Burns Cut River near Stockton, California. He felt a tug and reeled in something heavy. It was a large plastic bag. Inside, he found a human leg. The fisherman called the San Joaquin County Sheriff's Office. Find anything else out there? Deputies responded to the scene immediately. They confirmed the report of human remains and could find no clue as to the victim's identity. The deputies called in homicide detective sergeant Armando Mayoya, who would run the investigation. The search of the river for um, uh, any other items of evidence and body parts uh, continued through the night and then into the next morning. We were able to get a boat unit out to the river along with a uh, search of the banks uh, by uh, detectives. By first light, the deputies were dragging the river. While they checked the deeper water, detectives walked the riverbank. It wasn't long before they discovered another plastic bag. Inside were two arms. The wrists were bound together with masking tape. Hold it, hold it. Nearby, the boat unit deputy soon pulled up another object. It was a human torso wrapped in a sheet. Later, they would find a right leg, the victim's head, and some clothing, all in separate plastic bags. After several hours of searching, investigators had recovered an entire male body. They didn't know who the man was. It was a pretty brutal murder case, uh, 
and for someone to um, take the time to um, dismember a person and to um, you know transport that person in, in different bags and dispose of the body um, without caring you know it just it's very callous and cold. At the morgue, a coroner examined the remains. He determined that the victim had been dismembered with a serrated knife. It would take more time to determine the actual cause of death, or if the man was alive when he was dismembered. Detectives searched the clothing and found a wallet containing a California driver's license. It belonged to 40-year-old Sam Lee McCullough of Stockton. Police records showed McCullough had a minor arrest record. A fingerprint check confirmed his identity. After informing McCullough's family of his death, detectives got permission to check his house for evidence. Once the, uh, the victim was identified and we had a name uh, and a location where he lived, uh, we responded to the victim's address. Uh, he lived in the 5200 block of East Mariposa Road in South Stockton. They arranged to meet Sam McCullough's girlfriend at his home. She had reported McCullough missing earlier that day. Since he hadn't called her in several days, she checked McCullough's house and saw that the place was in disarray. Many items were missing, including his white Jeep Cherokee. Also missing were two shotguns, a revolver, and a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Detectives and deputies examined McCullough's house. Noting footprints on the floor, they conducted an electrostatic search to reveal details of the prints, which appeared to be made by boots. Investigators also recovered latent fingerprints, but none were foreign to the house. If the murder occurred in the house, the killer had removed any obvious evidence. A homicide of this nature, you would expect to find blood just all over the place, stains. Um, the person that was involved in this, this case took a lot of time to clean and uh, hide, his, uh, hide his tracks in this case. In the bathroom, a deputy made an important discovery. We were just about ready to, to leave when uh, we ran a flashlight through the, the tub area and we saw a reflection uh, come from the, uh, from the drain area. It looked like the sparkle from a sequin. The investigators knew it was collagen, a substance in bones that has a particularly oh, reflective quality. Uh, looking a little deeper into the drain, we found um, blood, um, tissue, and bone, and a large amount of, of hair. And based on that, um, there was a, a great probability at that point that uh, the victim had uh, been dismembered in the bathtub of the residence. Keep going over here. Laboratory tests would later match the blood and hair to Sam McCullough. Eventually, the coroner determined McCullough had been dead before he was dismembered. Cause of death was a gunshot wound to the forehead. What kind of level do you think it is, though? Powder burns indicated he had been shot at point-blank range. The coroner removed the bullet fragments and sent them to the state ballistics lab. Examiners there studied the size, weight, and composition of the fragments, determining that the murder weapon was a 22 caliber rifle. Comparing the fragments to slugs test fired from sample weapons can identify specific models. 
California Department of Justice examiners believe the weapon used was probably a Western Field brand rifle. Detectives found documents listing the serial numbers of McCullough's Jeep and his guns. They entered the numbers into the National Crime Information Center. The NCIC is a nationwide database used by law enforcement agencies to track criminals, missing persons, and stolen property. If the items turned up anywhere, San Joaquin detectives would be notified. Within days, a Stockton police officer discovered the victim's Jeep abandoned several miles from McCullough's house. Yet an examination yielded no additional clues. Investigators still had no leads on the killer. They canvassed McCullough's neighborhood, hoping to find a witness. No one reported seeing or hearing anything unusual. But one neighbor recalled that McCullough had been robbed two years earlier. Police records confirmed the story. In doing a name search, uh, we uncovered a report uh, listing the suspect as being a Stephen Horning. In that case, uh, Stephen had apparently, according to the victim, uh, robbed the victim at gunpoint. It was the first solid lead. Stephen Horning wasn't at his last known address, so detectives tracked down his older brother, who was a campus police officer at a nearby college. He told detectives that Stephen was one of five brothers and was especially close to one brother, Danny Ray Horning. Stephen and Danny spent a lot of time together, They often hunted and fished along the Burns Cut River, the same river where McCullough's body had been dumped. He told the detectives about one particular hunting trip Stephen and Danny had taken. They had shot a deer, brought it home, and, and butchered the deer uh, in the bathtub of the residence. And that was significant to us as uh, the victim had been dismembered in the same way. Okay. The eldest Horning brother added another detail familiar to detectives. After butchering the deer, Danny had placed the animal's limbs in black plastic garbage bags. Detectives thought the story had an eerie resemblance to the homicide of Sam McCullough. They asked the brother to identify some clothing found in a bag containing body parts in the Burns Cut River. He said that the black shorts and t-shirt looked like those his brother Danny often wore. Police noted that no one in the Horning family had seen Stephen or Danny since September 19th, the day Sam McCullough was probably killed. The investigation progressed to the point where uh, there was enough probable cause to, um, to present the case to a judge and a search warrant was issued for Stephen and Danny, along with an arrest warrant. On November 20th, 1990, two months after the murder, San Joaquin Sheriff's officers returned to the brothers' trailer located behind their parents' house. No one was inside, so detectives searched the surrounding area. Behind the trailer, they found important evidence. A cut stock and a sawed-off barrel from a rifle. Lab examiners had reported that the weapon used to kill McCullough was probably a Western Field brand 22 caliber rifle. 
the barrel found in the field next to the uh, suspect's house was a Western Field 22 caliber barrel. The next day, deputies went back to the trail. One of the brothers, Stephen Horning, was there. He was arrested and charged with murder. The second suspect, Stephen's brother, Danny Ray Horning, was nowhere to be found. Sit down here watching me. At the San Joaquin, California County Jail in December of 1990, detectives held one suspect in the murder and dismemberment of Sam McCullough. Stephen Horning had been arrested after a month-long investigation, but detectives needed more evidence to hold him. His brother, Danny Ray Horning, was also wanted but had fled the area. Stephen swore he had nothing to do with the murder and said he didn't know where Danny was. Since Stephen wouldn't help them locate Danny, the investigators turned to the Horning's father for answers. Mr. Horning offered valuable information regarding the possible murder weapon to Detective Sergeant Armando Mayoya. After speaking with the uh, suspect Danny's uh, father, I learned that, uh, that Danny had been seen with a sawed-off uh, 22 rifle. Their father said Danny and Stephen had been behind the trailer when Danny shot a dog with the 22. Then Stephen fired at it with a crossbow. Mr. Horning believed his sons had buried the dog in the field behind the trailer. Investigators searched the Horning's yard. They noticed one area seemed to be covered with freshly dug earth and began to excavate. Um, the dog was found and um, a search of the dog by another detective uh, found uh, a bullet in the brain. The bullet was processed at the state ballistics lab. Examiners determined that the dog was killed with a Western Field 22 caliber rifle. The same model had been used to murder Sam McCullough. The technician compared the bullet from the dog to the one that had killed McCullough. The tests indicated it was likely that both bullets were fired from the same weapon. Detectives returned to the county jail and confronted Stephen Horning. They described the damaging ballistics evidence, explaining that the bullet from the dog was consistent with the bullet that killed Sam McCullough and that his brother Danny had been seen with a Western Field 22. Realizing the case against them was strong, Stephen decided to cooperate. He claimed Danny had been in on the first robbery of McCullough two years earlier. Danny had vowed to kill McCullough for pressing charges. But then he went to prison for child molestation. When he got out a few months before McCullough's death, Danny had mentioned going back to rob McCullough again. Since no physical evidence implicated Stephen in Sam McCullough's death, investigators dropped the murder charge against him. They needed to find his brother, but Danny Ray Horning had disappeared. For six months, Detective Sergeant Armando Mayoya worked the case, but found no new leads. Then, on March 22, 1991, he was contacted by authorities in Winslow, Arizona, about Horning. Well, I received a phone call from uh, Winslow Police Department, and uh, they informed me that he had been arrested uh, in a bank robbery. That day, Horning had walked into the Valley National Bank in Winslow, more than 800 miles east of Stockton, California. He 
trained his 9mm pistol on the bank manager while a teller filled a bag with $25,000. When she was in the other room, the teller had tripped a silent alarm. A block away at the Winslow Police Department, Detective Elmer Hassey took the call. Under the concealment of the unmarked car, I had plenty of cover. Uh, positioned myself to where I could try to see what was going on in the bank. He couldn't see from the vehicle, so he went for a closer look. When the detective checked through the window, he saw a single gunman backing toward the door with a hostage. I came through the door. I stuck the gun up to his rib cage and uh, pulled him towards the wall and uh, took the bank bag out of his hand. The suspect was carrying a 9mm pistol. Detective Hassey determined the suspect's name was Danny Ray Horning. An NCIC check revealed the murder warrant in California. Hassey described the weapon recovered to Detective Mayoya. They informed me that they had in their possession a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. They gave me the serial number and I confirmed that uh, number as being the uh, weapon that was taken from uh, the victim uh, McCullough's residence. In Arizona, Horning was convicted of armed robbery, kidnapping, and assault. At trial, he dared a judge to give him the stiffest sentence possible, vowing to escape within a year. The judge accepted the challenge and gave Horning four life sentences. California authorities decided not to extradite Horning, who would serve his time at the Arizona State Prison in Florence, On May 12, 1992, prison officers doing the four o'clock head count found that prisoner number 85897 was not in his cell. The prison was locked down and thoroughly searched. But Danny Ray Horning was nowhere to be found. The convicted felon and suspected killer was on the run. On May 12, 1992, outside the Arizona State Prison in Florence, a massive manhunt began for escapee Danny Ray Horning, who had been serving four life sentences. Horning was also a suspect in a gruesome dismemberment in California. Arizona Department of Corrections fugitive investigator Doug Schuster helped organize the search. We have a lot of expert trackers, dogs, um, vehicles, equipment. The plan was to track him and apprehend him. We were planning to sight him, pick up a trail, follow him with dogs, horses, men, and, and locate him. Law enforcement teams from local, state, and federal agencies responded outside the prison. But Horning had disappeared from the immediate area. While the teams widened their circle, Schuster returned to the prison to try to figure out how the accused killer managed to escape. Prison officials contacted the FBI to assist in the investigation. Authorities first checked Horning's records. The convicted felon had been housed in Central Unit, the prison's most secure area. There was no evidence that he had tunneled out or otherwise breached the walls of Central. They interviewed corrections officers and inmates to determine Horning's last actions inside. Doug Schuster first determined why Horning wasn't in his locked cell. 
at any given time, not all inmates are locked in a cell. Some are out at work sites, some are working in the kitchen, some are working here and there. So you have uh, a portion of your inmates that are supposed to be in their cells. Another portion would be accounted for via an out count sheet. Uh, staff would visually see someone and say, these four inmates are in the kitchen working. So they wouldn't be in their cell during the count. Investigators learned that Horning had been assigned a janitorial job, which included cleaning the infirmary. This gave him access to medical uniforms. Well, he was able to obtain the white lab coat from the medical unit located inside the prison here. Um, he was able to get a, a pair of white pants from uh, the workers in the kitchen. Investigators believed Horning exchanged his prison uniform for the lab coat, white pants, and a forged employee ID. They believe that he simply walked out of the prison and just a few miles into the town of Florence. Investigators looked over Horning's record to try and determine where he might go. One possible destination was California, where Horning had family and connections. The other was Winslow, Arizona, where Horning had vowed to get even with the cops and FBI agents who had sent him to prison. Special Agent Keith Tolhurst of the FBI's Phoenix Field Office joined the investigation. Hey, are you going up there with him? Are you going to take dog teams up there? He would work closely with the Department of Corrections to stop Horning before he struck again. The information from the prison told us that they believed he was going to rob some more banks and then go to Winslow and try to uh, kill either the Valley National Bank uh, people that he robbed the bank from or kill the agents. So we believed he was going to head that direction. The agent examined the items left in Horning's cell. They would be sent to profilers at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. We started uh, getting involved with our behavioral science unit as well to see if they could profile this guy to find out whether he's the type of individual that would carry out his threats. And basically it, it came back later that it looked like he would be able or at least capable of carrying out those kind of threats. If Horning was willing to kill FBI agents, no one was safe. The first solid lead in the hunt for Horning came three days after his escape. On May 15th, Penal County Sheriff's deputies responded to a ranch house 15 miles west of the prison. The owner said the house had been burglarized. He said clothes, a pair of binoculars, and food were taken from his house. Also missing were several loaded guns. The FBI and local deputies believed it was Horning, stocking up for his bid to seek revenge. They were right. Uh, and they found a fingerprint of his at the house to confirm that it was him that, that uh, had done that. So now we... Uh, we're a little more concerned even that uh, he was headed uh, in the direction that he had said uh, because he was starting to try to carry out his plan. Good afternoon. We're holding this press conference. The fugitive was now armed. The FBI turned to the media to warn the public and to solicit their help. At a news conference, agents released Horning's photo and information about his escape. Anyone spotting Horning was asked to call the FBI immediately, though they were instructed not to approach the suspected killer. The media coverage generated many leads. One came into the FBI from campers, claiming that Horning was stealing food, maps, and camping gear near Lake Mormon, about 170 miles north of the prison. Even though Horning knew how to hunt and fish, the burglaries were essential to his survival in the woods. Local officers followed his trail. 
break into cabins, he'd steal food, uh, and then he'd move on. And what we ended up trying to do was a uh, a house-to-house -house search of all the cabins in the area. That was something that was going to be done by the local uh, county sheriff offices, and they were searching as many houses as they could. Morning was getting closer to the Grand Canyon National Park. The summer tourist season was beginning, which meant thousands of people would be in danger. They had to find him before anyone got hurt. Based on Horning's trail north, fugitive response teams from the Arizona Department of Corrections and Sheriff's Departments focused their search in Coconino County. It was an enormous undertaking. Coconino County consists of over 18,000 acres of woods and difficult terrain. Perfect cover for a fugitive. We're in the mountains. It was uh, Lake Mormon area. Uh, it was uh, trees, mountains, rocks, hills, helicopters, massive amount of uh, mobilization, radios, dogs, horses, trailers. Just uh, massive. On June 3rd, 1992, a National Forest Service officer was patrolling a campground in Coconino County. The officer spotted Horning walking out of a wooded area. It was too dangerous for a lone officer to follow the armed killer into the forest. When reinforcements arrived, Danny Ray Horning had disappeared once again. The deadly fugitive was still on the loose. In the summer of 1992, Danny Ray Horning escaped from prison in Florence, Arizona after serving only nine months of four life sentences. The FBI believed the suspected killer was heading north towards Winslow, Arizona to seek revenge on agents who had locked him away. On June 11th, agents responded to a report of a cabin burglary near the town of Pine, midway between the prison and Winslow. This time, Horning stole a truck and tried to establish himself as an outlaw celebrity, according to FBI Special Agent Keith Tolhurst. More guns were stolen from there, and then uh, that's where he left a note that said, uh, you know, thank you for the, for the items, uh, Danny Ray. And uh, trying to make his folk hero uh, name known, I guess. When the story hit the news, investigators worried the public might not realize how deadly Horning was. They knew he had likely dismembered a man in California. Now Horning had a vehicle, was armed, and was nearing the Grand Canyon National Park as tens of thousands of tourists were beginning their vacations. For 10 days, no new sightings came in. With the truck, he might have been hundreds of miles away already. Then, on June 21st, a Department of Public Safety officer spotted the stolen truck 50 miles north of Pine. Danny Ray Horning was driving. The officer called for backup. Before other officers could respond, Horning jumped from the truck, then fled on foot into the now familiar cover of the woods. FBI agents responded immediately. In the truck, they found another note signed by Horning. Pine, Arizona uh, is again up in a wooded area. Um, uh, in northern Arizona, and it's 
along the path, if you're going from Florence up to Pine, uh, he's almost to Winslow. Uh, so he's getting a lot closer to the area that, uh, that we were concerned about. And uh, again, we knew he had weapons, we knew he had the vehicle, he got up into that area, and it made us believe even more that he was uh, gonna try to carry out his threats. Authorities in Winslow weren't the only ones in danger. The FBI established a field command post inside Grand Canyon National Park, where Horning was a threat to thousands of tourists. They tracked confirmed sightings, plotting out Horning's movements. Agents coordinated the response to each sighting and relayed information between the many law enforcement agencies involved. The territory being searched was vast, and Horning was moving quickly. On June 23rd, two tourists reported to agents that Horning had carjacked them inside the National Park. The couple said they were in a parking lot the day before when Horning commandeered their car at gunpoint. He demanded that they drive him to the canyon's rim. He checked into a hotel room there and forced his captives inside. His gun prevented them from calling for help. The couple feared he might shoot them at any moment. Horning recorded a message for authorities. He demanded that the search for him be called off. He also ordered the release of one of his brothers from prison and a million dollars ransom for the release of a family that he planned to kidnap in exchange for the childless couple. The next day, Horning forced the couple to drive him to a store where he purchased camping gear, new clothing and food. But before he found a family with children to kidnap, a Forest Service officer recognized him and began following the car. No, no movement. Morning fired at the officer, causing him to slow down. He forced the driver to speed up. Move it! Shut up! Let's go! When he had gained some distance, Horning ordered the car stop. He jumped out and fled on foot. Since he shot at a law officer, it was clear Horning was becoming desperate and more dangerous. We had information that he'd vowed not to be taken alive. He was um, on this vendetta against uh, the FBI and Valley National Bank and, and that he had already been in a shooting uh, with the Forest Service. So we were very cautious as far as going in the woods, which we couldn't just go running after him as fast as he may have been running, uh, which is one of the ways he got some advance uh, time on us. The kidnapped couple provided agents with information about Horning's new clothes and plan. Once again, armed search parties scoured the area where Horning was last seen but found no trace of him. Horning was back on foot and hiding out somewhere in the immense Grand Canyon National Park. He had vowed to kidnap a family with children. Come on, come on guys. To stop him, the FBI brought in their elite hostage rescue team known as the HRT. The HRT agents blanketed the area, repelling into the canyon, checking caves and conducting aerial searches. They had to find the suspected killer before he had the chance to kill again.
Search teams from the FBI, the Arizona Department of Corrections, and local sheriff's departments trailed fugitive Danny Ray Horning through Grand Canyon National Park. They mobilized dozens of officers, tracking dogs, and helicopters in the effort to find Horning before he kidnapped more hostages. But the accused killer could have been anywhere in the immense park's 1.2 million acres. Because of the danger Horning presented to tourists, the FBI decided to close the Grand Canyon National Park for the July 4th weekend. It was a major undertaking. The holiday is the park's busiest weekend of the year. It was also the first time in the park's 73-year history that it had been closed due to a criminal threat. But Horning was dangerous enough to warrant the extreme action, according to FBI Special Agent Keith Tolhurst. He was moving around inside the canyon, and we couldn't control that because there was too many people in the canyon. So we were going to try to start getting everybody through the roadblocks and uh, try to find him. New visitors were turned away, and those already in the park were asked to leave. Police set up roadblocks at entry and exit points around the Grand Canyon. They searched vehicles and informed motorists of Horning. But they didn't stop him in time. On July 4th, two British tourists were preparing to leave the park when an armed man approached them. They knew it was Danny Ray Horning, though he no longer looked like the photos in news reports. He was much thinner, had blonde hair, and was clean shaven. Since the park had been locked down, the women were Horning's only way out. At a roadblock, a ranger stopped the car and spoke to the three inside. Horning had threatened to kill the women if they tipped off anyone. The kidnapped women had to act calm as Horning sat with a gun trained on them. The officer didn't recognize the blonde-haired Horning and let them through. Once they were out of the park, he forced them to drive 60 miles south to Williams, Arizona. When they were far from the police in the out, Grand Canyon, out, you, Horning out, ordered out, them to stop the car. Brandishing his gun, he marched the terrified women into the cover of the woods. The women believed that Horning was taking them there to execute them. Yeah. To their relief, he left them there fleeing in their car. The women managed to free themselves and ran to a store. A clerk there called authorities and was told an officer was nearby. The women were badly shaken, but unharmed. They provided police with updated information about Horning, including his new look and his getaway vehicle. We had put a description of the car out that the women had stolen from them, and uh, a DPS officer spotted that car going from the Grand Canyon towards Phoenix. Highway Patrolman Stephen Costello works for the Arizona Department of Safety. When Horning drove past, he began following the armed fugitive. It 
wasn't long before it became more than a car chase. I hear a, a great big old bang, and I thought it was something wrong with the car. I looked at the gauges all as well. At that particular time, I realized I'd been shot at, and uh, I notified my dispatcher uh, at that time that uh, I'd been shot at, uh, that I was all right, and I was going to follow him. The gunfire forced the patrolman to keep his distance. He's going to be taking the ramp at, But he knew he uh, couldn't uh, lose Horning. The fugitive tried to make a getaway by turning off near the town of Sedona. He takes the ramp and I can see that uh, he slammed on the brakes uh, and he skids in and he has a, a slight accident is what he does. He hits a, uh, a sign. I shot it out, uh, you know, you better stop. The shot missed. The officer had orders not to follow Horning into the woods. When backup arrived, agents and officers began a grid search of the area. Again, Horning couldn't be found. After nightfall, a lead was called in to the command post. A resident said he saw Horning drinking from a garden hose in a neighborhood near Sedona. A border patrol agent responded to the call. As far as anyone knew, Horning was still armed. This time, there was no shootout. After being relentlessly pursued for 54 days and over hundreds of miles, an exhausted Horning simply gave up. No doubt in my mind that uh, because of the efforts of the teams that had been chasing him, uh, that they had basically run him into the ground. He was laying there, dog tired with his tongue hanging out, and uh, for a man who still had his weapon on him and vowed not to be taken alive, all he wanted was a glass of water. Danny Ray Horning earned six more years for his actions during his violent flight. Authorities in California decided to extradite Horning and charge him with the murder of Sam McCullough. His trial began on May 12, 1994. Prosecuting attorneys proved that in September of 1990, Danny Horning broke into Sam McCullough's house to rob him. Horning was angry that McCullough had pressed charges after an earlier robbery. He bound McCullough, rendering him helpless. Horning was using his sawed-off 22 caliber Western field rifle, the same one witnesses had seen him kill a dog with earlier. At point-blank range, Horning fired one shot at Sam McCullough. Minute blood spatter, as well as the human tissue found in the drain, indicated Horning had likely dismembered the victim in his tub. Then he dumped the body parts into the Burns Cut River. On July 15, 1994, about four years after the death of Sam McCullough, a California jury found Horning guilty of murder. He was sentenced to death. Danny Ray Horning was sent to San Quentin Prison. He remains locked down in the maximum security of death row. <laughs>